Greetings, everybody. Scott Dixon with Trout's Fly Fishing. Uh, today I'm doing a presentation on uh, winter fishing on tailwaters. So we're going to be talking about a lot of the different tailwaters about throughout the state, uh, techniques for fishing them, gear to use, uh, what tailwaters are, and uh, fly selections and a whole bunch of stuff going to cover today. Um, but thanks for tuning in and uh, joining me tonight. Um, first thing I'm going to talk about is tailwaters and what exactly tailwaters are. Uh, tailwaters are basically the rivers below a dam. Um, throughout the state, we have a whole bunch of different tailwaters. Uh, the main ones that are most popular in and around the Colorado and Denver area are going to be the, a lot of them along the South Platte, like uh, the Dream Stream, Levin Mile Canyon, Cheeseman Canyon. Uh, the Deckers area below that is still kind of considered tailwater as well. Um, then you have Waterton Canyon, the Blue River uh, below Dillon Reservoir, uh, the Blue River below Green Mountain Reservoir, the Williams Fork, Frying Pan, Colorado, um, the Arkansas River below Pueblo Reservoir. All of those are great uh, wintertime tailwater fisheries. Um, one thing that makes those great fisheries during the wintertime is the fact that uh, during this time of year when a lot of the freestone rivers are starting to freeze, you're going to have cold, consistent water uh, below those dams where it's not going to be iced up. A lot of times the tailwaters, the water that's coming out of the, the dam is going to be warmer than the, t the waters that you'd find on freestone rivers. Um, a lot of times the water coming out of them are going to be warmer than the air temperature. So it makes it a good place to find open water during the, the winter months. And when you find open water, you're also going to find a lot of fish. Um, having that cool kind of consistent flow down below the dams, um, a lot of times you're going to get consistent hatches, a lot of different, um, a lot of uh, good stream life uh, where a lot of bugs and um, insects are going to live and thrive and and when there's food in the water, you're also going to find a bunch of fish. Um, the uh, tailwaters throughout the state um, during the winter time they do get busy, but you'll find a lot of solitude out there as well, especially if you're willing to hike into different spots. Um, during the winter time, a lot of people uh, will stop fishing, but there's really no need to it. It does get cold out there, um, but with the cold. Uh, like I said, with the water below the dam still being warm and uh, free-flowing and ice-free, uh, you'll still get a lot of opportunities to, to find open water to fish, whereas a lot of the freestones around the state, um, the Eagle, parts of the Colorado, uh, a lot of the Arkansas, a lot of those are going to be iced up and won't be able to fish throughout the year. Um, so those are some of the aspects that make uh, tailwater fishing during the wintertime such a great opportunity to get out. Um, with the tailwaters and fishing them in the winter, with the open water, uh, one thing that they do have a lot of insect life, but during the winter months, there's not a variety of insects. Main thing that you're going to find on the tailwater are midges. Uh, besides the midges, you'll have some betas in spots. I know that uh, the Arkansas Pueblo uh, some of the winter months, but a lot of them all throughout the state, you're going to be finding a lot of small midges and those fish are going to be hunkered down uh, during the summer months and even in the fall and spring, you'll find fish that are kind of in the, the riffles or faster moving water. Uh, a lot of times during the winter months, just get a little sluggish. So they're going to be a lot of times in slow deep pools where they're not going to have to move a ton um, to go get their food. So that's some of the challenges that uh, come with fishing the tailwaters. Uh, uh, let's see what it goes for fishing the tailwaters. Um, one thing that's very important for the winter fishing is layering and having the right gear. A lot of times you're hiking into places or fishing during those winter months, it's going to be really cold outside. So layering up is always a good thing. Uh, you could have days where it's in the 20s or you could have days in the 40s. It's Colorado around here. So you're going to get. Uh, 
Personally, I always go with the idea of having lots of layers, and then as the day warms up, being able to shed those layers. Um, I usually, or pretty much I exclusively used uh, uh, chest waders. Uh, the Sims G3s, G4s uh, are great waders. Uh, use them year round. Uh, you can layer up underneath them and still stay warm while you're out in the water. Uh, having some puffy jackets to, for insulation, and then if you get days having a shell over the top, something just to keep you warm and dry. Uh, once you start getting wet, just like any sport that you do, once you start getting wet, um, you're going to get cold. And a lot of times in the tailwaters, you'll be fishing, especially during the winter months with long shadows. You may be fishing in the shade, so the air temperature might not warm up too much. Uh, another thing that I like using out on the tailwaters, especially during the wintertime, uh, nine foot four weight. I use a Winston Pure. Uh, it's my dry fly rod during the summer months. During the winter months, I like it for my nymph rigs. It has that soft tip. So as I'm using 6 or 7x tippet, um, I'm not going to be snapping fish off on the hook sets. It's got that nice soft tip out there. Um, I think the four weights are, are ideal for a lot of the Colorado tailwaters. If you're looking to find some of the big pigs that hang out by the frying pan or on the Taylor River, uh, those fish that eat the mices and end up getting real big, those areas and those fisheries, you may want to have a fiber. But for most of the other ones, uh, Williams Fork, um, all the South Platte tailwaters, all of those, a good four weight is something I really like fishing with. Um, the Pure, the Winston Pure, it has enough backbone where it can turn over indicator rigs and then it also has a, a soft enough tip that when you set that hook, you're not going to break off that 6 or 7x tippet. Um, when I'm using my gear uh, or my materials that I'm using, I usually go with a like a 9.5 4x or a 9 foot 4x leader or a 7.5 foot uh, 4x leader. And then I'm going to build it out a little bit longer. I'm going to add some 5x fluorocarbon to it. And then depending upon conditions and flows and what the water level is, I may even go down to 7x. Usually I try to catch them first on 5 or 6x. I'm finding that if uh, fish are super spooky and selective, I may go down to the 7x tippet. But I'd, ideally, I'd like to try to catch them on 6x first. A lot of times when you're fishing to the tailwater fish that are rather selective, they're going to let you know if uh, you can get away with 6x or if you're going to need to go up a, a sentence. So, Yvonne, question. Uh, we have a question from Timothy Bowling. Uh, do fish get spooked by my aluminum bars on my boots hitting hitting the rocks? Am I being? Am I trying to be as sly as possible? You are trying to be as sly as possible. And it kind of depends upon where you're at. Uh, all different tailwaters are going to be, they all have their own characteristics. Um, the metal bars, I don't use uh, the metal bars on my boots, so I'm not exactly sure how much sound they're going to be making. Um, if you're out cruising around and you scuff a rock and you see fish move from it, then that's kind of a sign that those might be making a little too much noise and you might have to try a little more stealthy approach. Um, a lot of times you get up there, you can see fish, and if you're clumping around and they're not spooking away, then I would absolutely go ahead and use them if you're more comfortable walking on those than other ones. So, another question. This is another gear question from Brooks. Brooks is asking, any tips for keeping your feet warm when wading? Uh, my Keeping your feet warm is tough. You're standing in the water, you're walking around. Uh, my kind of go-to for winter fishing is I use a really thin pair of um, uh, like a liner sock and then I use a thick heavy wool sock over the top. Um, I know some people that will put foot warmers in there to help uh, keep their feet warm. I always find those a little bit, I can feel them when they're in my boots and in my waders. So I usually don't like wearing them, but I know a lot of people will put them down their, their waders to keep their feet warm. But uh, the two sock layer for me is how I usually try to keep my feet warm. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. 
I find if I'm fishing a spot and I end up getting uh, cold feet, best way to warm them up is get out of the water, take a hike to a new spot, and uh, uh, get those feet moving a little bit. Uh, that a lot of times is a good way to help warm them, warm them up. Um, let's see. We were talking about waders and boots, uh, rods and reels. Oh, go ahead, Yvonne. Uh, another question uh, from Craig. We actually have another, a couple questions lining up. Craig Miller asks, tips for keeping guides from freezing up during the winter? That's another tough question. I know some people that have put uh, Vaseline on the their guides to help them out, um, but I'm not exactly sure what that does to your fly line. Uh, so I usually end up just having to uh, fish and then I'll break the ice off the guides. The best way to do it if you do get ice off the guy or ice on the guides and to get them off is to set that rod down and kind of walk down towards the end and do each guide individually. Um, last year I made the mistake of trying to bend the rod a little bit and flick ice off the guides at the tip and I snapped the tip of the rod. Um, I should know better but still happens sometimes and it breaks. Um, those cold days you're going to get ice on those guides um, and the best thing to, to do is just try to stay on top of it, getting it clean. A lot of times when you're out there you're going to get uh, ice on the line as well, especially on those cold days. And again what I like doing is pulling a little bit of line off the reel, setting the rod down on the bank, not in the water because a lot of times if you get your reel wet you'll notice that it will freeze up as well and kind of get locked in. So. I would set the reel down on the bank, strip that line through your hand with a pair of gloves or something, get that ice broken off the, the line, then work on the reels. And once you kind of get it free, uh, go ahead and start casting it, fish it uh, for as long as you can until that ice comes back. And on those cold, cold days, you're just going to be fighting it all day long. And it's kind of a pain, but you're up there fishing, so you got to make the best of it. So... Um, all right, I kind of went through the gear, and now I'm going to talk about uh, uh, sight fishing and, and uh, finding the fish when you're at the tailwater. Um, another benefit of the winter fishing time is a lot of the tailwaters are going to have lower flows, um, and it makes it pretty easy to locate and spot the fish. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of times the fish are going to be moving uh, away from the riffles into more of the pocket or a little bit slower holding water. Um, a lot of times, especially when I go up into Cheeseman, I get drawn towards those big pools up there. I look down, I can see a bunch of fish. Um, I'm always tempted to fish to those, but if the water's moving real slow, uh, it makes it really tough to get a nice presentation on those fish. I usually like trying to locate and see fish that are kind of on the edge of some moving water where you can still get a good drift in there. Um, it's a tricky proposition doing that. Um, if you can find them in holding waters, a lot of times I will try going for it, going with a really light rig. Uh, it's kind of a slow presentation. A lot of times those fish have op ample opportunity to look and decide if they want to eat your flies or not. Um, if I'm finding that I'm getting rejected in spots like that, those are the times where I may go down to a 7x tippet or a 6x and see if I can get them. If I'm still getting rejected on those, a lot of times I'm going to go look for some other fish that are in water that's moving a little bit more. Water that's moving a little bit quicker, um, those fish don't have time to sit there and think about whether they want to eat it or not. A lot of times they're just going to react. Um, fish that think um, just make things a little bit harder. Uh, if you have one that's looking at your stuff and you see it moving away uh, as it's going by, then that's kind of a selective smart fish. And during the winter months, you'll find a lot of those. Uh, finding fish that are in the moving water, a lot of times they'll just react. They'll see something coming by and they'll make that split sec second decision to eat it. And uh, those are the fish I like trying to find. Um, they, it doesn't always work out because it's fishing, but ideally those are the ones that I'm going to... As I'm hiking around on the river, uh, a lot of times I'm just moving up and down till I find fish in certain spots. Um, as you move around the tailwaters, you should be able to find them in quite a few spots with the lower flows. Uh, Yvonne, another question. 
So we have a lot of good questions, and we'll try to I'll try to space these out uh, so where it makes sense through your presentation. Uh, but sort of similar okay. to you know we're talking about sight fishing now, uh, where to look. Um, this might not be directly related to sight fishing, but uh, there is a question about uh, from Jason: Do fish hang out underneath the ice near flows? So uh, where you have flowing water, do you see fish hanging out near the ice? Uh, yes, they do. And it's kind of, it's situational, like all fishing. Um, if there's a good uh, current coming along that uh, edge of the ice, and there's a little bit of depth there where they feel protected, a lot of times you will see the fish that are moving from under the ice out into the moving water to get food. Um, so those are good places to, to fish. A lot of times I like doing the, the cast and drag where I'll put it right over onto the ice and just drag it right over the edge and let it drop off. And you'll get that nice drip that's right along the edge. Um, that works out pretty well. Sometimes you'll notice that your uh, flies will get stuck on the ice or some of the snow on the bank. Um, but then I usually will just do a, a little roll cast back over the ice, get my bugs free, try it another time. Um, if you are finding that you're constantly catching that edge and that technique is hard, then just work at that cast to get it right over next to the edge of it and let those drifts go down beside the ice. Um, if you are not seeing any fish there, I would still be a spot where I would uh, do a handful of drifts just to see. Um, you never know. There could be some underneath that that you just don't see. And then there's times where you're thinking it looks like the perfect spot for fish to hang out and you just might not find any there. So um, I would always, I'm always under the assumption that there's going to be a fish in those spots. And so it's always worth working it a little bit. Uh, if I'm not finding it though, I'm going to go ahead and move on. So um, I'm going to go, or do you got another question, Yvonne? Okay. Um, back to sight fishing and uh, clues to look for, what to look for. Um, again, when they're in the big slow pools, those fish are fairly easy to see with the good clean water that's coming out from below the dam. Um, but as you're walking around, uh, a lot of the tailwaters will have uh, just little pockets, uh, little boulder areas. And a lot of times I'm going to stand on the bank and look uh, over either in front or behind those spots. Um, if there's a little bit of depth where the fish have protection and can be in a good feeding lane, I'm going to check it out before I start casting because I want my cast to be uh, effective. If I'm not seeing anything in there, I might just sit around and uh, look for a few seconds, see if I see anything in there. Um, and then if I do, I'm going to try to figure out how I'm going to get my drift to that fish. Um, if it's over behind the rock, I may need to go on one side of the rock or the other. Um, but look at the moving water around such structure and let that kind of help dictate where you're going to try to put your cast. Um, one thing that I'm going to be talking about in just a little bit is uh, managing depth. And when I get over to rigging and stuff, I'll kind of go over that a little bit more. Um, but when you're spotting and seeing fish, you might be adding and subtracting split shot or adjusting your indicator all day long as you're way up and down the river looking for fish. Um, when you see one that's kind of uh, right behind a, you're going to need to get it down pretty quick. So it lands in front of the rock and has time to swing down into his feeding window. Um, that's the type of spot where you're going to need to add some weight to it to uh, be able to get it down to that fish. Um, a lot of times the difference between a good day and a great day up on the tailwaters is just uh, adding split shot. Um, if you're not getting the right depth or if you're getting too deep and it's dragging the bottom too quick, uh, then you might just be either going under the fish or right over the top of them, or you might be just snagging up the whole time. So um, I'm going to go over and now I'm going to start talking more about rigging and I'll go into the depth and the adjustments of the indicators a little bit more. Um, a lot of times with fishing in the wintertime with the lower flows, uh, you're going to need to uh, I usually start with a lead fly. You know, I want that lead fly to do two things. First, I want it to help get the uh, fish's attention. Um, and a lot of times I'm going to be using stuff that they're going to want to eat regardless if it uh, gets their attention or not. 
Um, but a lot of times, I want them to be looking over in the direction of my flies. Uh, depending upon the depth and where you're fishing, uh, the lead fly may be something a little bit heavier to help sink your bugs down. Uh, sometimes you may want something that uh, if you have a, some split shot on there, um, then you don't need quite as big a lead fly. Um, but generally, my lead flies during the winter months, um, I'm going to use egg patterns. I'll use uh, sand one worms. I'll use leeches, uh, uh, crane fly larva, uh, scuds. I'll use food that the uh, fish are going to eat. In certain uh, rivers, the blue, the tailor, the frying pan, having a mycetes as a lead is a great idea. A lot of those reservoirs will have a split shot, or will have split shot. They'll have a mice shrimp in them, and those fish below grow real big just because they gorge themselves on those mice as they're coming out below the dam. Um, but it kind of uh, it depends upon how you're working the river and which runs your work. A lot of times I'll use a heavier or bigger fly down on the bottom. And that way, I'll be able to get my flies down a little bit uh, deeper, quicker. So those ones are dragging the bottom first. Uh, another question, Yvonne. Okay, we're going to knock out a couple questions while we're talking about rigging. Um, and I think okay. some of them are things you'll talk about naturally, but I just want to make sure we touch them. Um, so Giles was asking, uh, can you still use an indicator or is it best to go without? Um I, a lot of times, I like using an indicator. Um, I use, a lot of times during the year, I'll use the little thingamabobber type indicators. During the winter months, I tend to use more yarn. It lands on the water a little bit softer. You can make them a little bit more sparse. Um, the strikes out there on a lot of the rivers during the winter time are very subtle. And you want something that is going to be uh, sensitive enough to detect strikes but also um, big enough to it's going to support your rig. So if you do have to get it down deeper, um, every now and then you may end up taking the light yarn off and going with a like a indicator rig, uh, like a thingamabobber type, um, just so that way you make sure your um, flies are suspended properly. Um, with the yarn, sometimes if you have a lot of heavy weight on there and you have it real sparse at first, you'll notice that it starts getting pulled under the water. Um, if you are a Euronympher, then that is a good way to approach the rivers during the winter time too, where you can just use your sight line and high stick over uh, fish when you see them out in areas. So, uh, next question, Yvonne. Next question is, let's see, let me pull back through. Any issues with 7X tippet becoming brittle and breaking in cold temperatures? Um, not necessarily that I've noticed all that much. I mean, 7X is pretty light to begin with. Um, I haven't noticed much of the fluorocarbon tippet getting uh, brittle during the colder months. Um, but I do, if I am going to go with uh, 7X, I'm going to be a little bit more delicate on my hook sets. Um, it doesn't take much to break two and a half pounds to whatever 7X is. Um, and that's why a lot of times I'm going to start with 6. Because if I can catch them on 6, I'd rather do that than try to catch them on 7. But if those fish are the ones that tell you that uh, you need to switch and go lighter, then by all means go down to 7X. I could, I could Another question? that fishing 7X is always, it's always going to break. But. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing, but sometimes it's necessary so to, to get those smart fish. So, But it is, it's a, a little bit tougher that, with the 7X. We have another, another question, cool. um, and you were touching on this a little bit, and I think it sort of leads well into the rest of your slide. Brandon's asking, curious on the best way to use split while nymphing. Uh, how heavy do you have to start? Um, so, yeah, very situational type question. So, I want to have enough weight and enough depth between my strike indicator and my weights that my flies, kind of my rule of thumb is about every six casts, I want it to tick bottom a little bit. If I'm not ticking bottom on about by the sixth cast or so, I don't think I have enough weight on there. 
So I might either increase the length of my indicator, just move it up a little bit and see if that allows my flies to get down uh, towards the bottom. Or if I notice that it's just not sinking quite as much, then I'll add another split shot. Um, the managing your depth and weight is such a huge part of winter fishing. Um, it can really make your day when you get it dialed in correctly. Um, a lot of times if I have my weights on there, like I said, the first thing I'm going to do if I'm still not hitting bottom, I might just move my indicator up a little bit. Um, I don't want it to be hitting bottom every time, so I'm constantly having to clean stuff off my, uh, my flies. Because on tailwaters, they're going to have a lot of vegetation on those. And uh, you are going to get down there and collect some moss and stuff that you're going to need to clean off because fish don't like having the, the salad on the flies. They like uh, just the, the regular old flies out there. So it's important to um, kind of play around with it and make those subtle adjustments just to make sure you're at the right depth. Once you get in the right depth and you uh, fish a hole for a bit and you decide to move upstream, you're going to have to start from scratch again. You're going to have to adjust your indicator, maybe take some more split shut off. Maybe it's a deeper hole where you're going to need to add some or lengthen your indicator. But it's always kind of a, uh, it's always kind of a guessing game uh, when you get up there to try to get it figured out. Um, I, a lot of times, just from my experience going up there, I'll be able to kind of look at the river and see what I hope to have happen. And I'll have my rig set accordingly. It may work out on the first time, or I might have to start making adjustments and get it all figured out and dialed in. So um, it's a kind of a guessing game, and it's a trial and error game. Um, but it is a, a big part of the wintertime uh, fishing is uh, managing that depth properly. So um, let's see. I was talking about uh, the lead flies. I kind of went over the list of ones that I'm going to have. Um, generally when I'm out there, if I'm using an indicator style rig, a lot of times I'm going to have my lead fly as the, the first one up top, and then I'm going to put smaller stuff down below it. Um, I will use sometimes just a two fly rig, but during the winter months, a lot of times I'll go with a three fly rig. Uh, usually below my, my lead fly, I'm going to do a, uh, a midge, or if there's still betas present, I'll do a betas and then drop a smaller midge down below it. Um, a lot of the midges that I use are going to be uh, 20s, 22s, 24s. Um, I really don't fish 26s uh, much at all, just mainly because I have a hard time seeing them. Those fish do see them, though, and the people that have uh, good eyes and can tie them on uh, good, I would not be afraid of using the, uh, the 26s. But kind of my standard midge box during the year, uh, during the winter time, is 24s up to 20s. Um, a lot of times when you're on the river, if you're seeing the bugs flying around, seeing midges active, uh, you can kind of take a look and see if you can uh, get away with going bigger ones. Uh, a lot of times in the later part of the winter time, you'll see some, some pretty good-sized midges that are flying around. And on those days, it's always a treat where you decide, oh, I could get away with using an 18 today instead of a, a 24. Um, but a lot of times those during the winter months, uh, those small midges are the ticket. And with the midges, one thing that I like doing, uh, a lot of them all have similar profiles. Uh, but what I end up doing a bit is just playing around with them as far as uh, color. Uh, if some have flash, maybe I'll use a purple one, maybe a blue one or red, cream, olive, white. Um, but uh, during the, the time when I'm up there fishing, if I see midges active on the water um, and I'm not getting hits, I'm going to start playing around with uh, the color and size. If I notice I'm a little too big, I'm going to make them smaller. Um, if I'm having no luck on one specific uh, fly, I like going ahead and switching them up. During the winter months, I like keeping my flies a little bit closer together than I would during the winter time. Uh, a lot of times I'll start with them about a foot apart, and as I'm switching them, they may get down to only about uh, 8 to 10 inches apart, and I don't mind having them that close. Um, a lot of times these fish are going to be a little bit lethargic, and they're not going to move very far to eat food, especially when it's uh, super small. 
So you want to get them right or you want to get your flies right down to the fish. And a lot of times if you have them spread out pretty far during the winter months, you're getting a lot of micro drifts on your, your dropper flies where they might be swinging around a little too much uh, and might just be missing your, your flies. Going with a little bit tighter or shorter rig from your first fly to your second onto your third, a lot of times you can get those flies to get your desired area a little bit better. Um, and then, uh, yeah, with the, the flies and, uh, talking with the, the midges during the winter time, if you're not on a river that has mices, like I said, play around with them. There's a lot of good, uh, midge patterns out there. And some days you'll find that they're on one and not the others. Um, but play around with your size and color. That's a great way to start. And midges are always going to be present during almost all of our tailwaters during our winter months. Uh, go ahead, Yvonne. So I'm going to get a couple questions in here. Uh, let's see. Um, Julian keeps on hearing about reds. Any advice on how to spot them and stay away from them? Yes. So good question, Julian. Uh, I appreciate when people ask about the reds. So in the fall, the browns are spawning, but during a lot of the tailwaters, you'll find even rainbows that are, are spawning during the, the winter time. Uh, for identifying reds, uh, my kind of what I look for when I'm walking around is you'll look at the riverbed under the water and a lot of it's going to be covered with moss and stuff. If you get to areas where it looks like it's cleaned off and it is obvious, um, obviously cleaner than other areas that have a lot of moss on it, that could be a sign that that's a red where a fish has come over there, cleaned some get down to the cobble substrate of the riverbed uh, to drop eggs. Um, as I'm walking around, I'm always looking where I'm going, and I always recommend people do that just for safety reasons. Of course. Um, but if you happen to see an area where it looks like it's clean or there's a little depression in an uh, uh, area where that looks like it's been clean, then those are areas that you want to avoid walking in. Um, those fish that spawn during the, the fall and even during some of the winter months, I mean, those are going to be uh, nice-sized fish in years to come. So. Definitely try to avoid uh, walking through the reds and everything. Another question. So these are more rigging style uh, questions. Uh, Colin has a question. Any good tips to avoid lightweight indicators getting pulled down by small ice flows coming downstream? Oh, a lot of times it is based on your cast. Uh, when you're getting ready to put your flies out there, uh, look and see if there's any chunks of ice that are coming down because that's tough when ice upstream has a warm day, you get some ice that's breaking off upstream and there's a bunch of chunks of ice. Uh, a lot of times I'll cast land right on a chunk and I'll just kind of drag it back, roll cast right back out there. Um, a lot of it is just uh, planning that's involved and in presentation of where you're putting that cast. Uh, if you see some chunks coming down, uh, keep that rod tip up high for a minute, wait for it to pass from where you're going to shoot your line, and then go ahead and, and shoot it. Uh, if you find you land directly on something, sometimes you can give it a quick little tug, see if it comes right off there, and then allows to drop properly. So, uh, Go ahead. Another question ben. from Climb Sequoia is, every, are you ever not using the indicator rig? Are you ever throwing streamers? Um. Yes, I'll use streamers from time to time, but uh, those it kind of uh, it depends upon the fish activity and what they're doing. Um, during the winter months, when those fish are a little bit more lethargic on the tailwaters, um, you may find days where those fish aren't moving at all. But if you have some of those warm days where those fish are active and happy and moving around, uh, streamers can be a, a great way to go. Um, a lot of times, most of the time, I'll be nymphing, but there's also plenty of opportunities on a lot of the tailwaters to be throwing dry flies. And it's always a, a good bet to uh, be looking around, see if you see any heads poke up. Um, I'd always rather throw uh, dries than, than nymphs, but it's not always the most effective way during the winter months. 
Um, but again, some of those nice warm days, you'll get fish that are active, um, real happy, will be willing to chase streamers. Um, but also you'll get fish that are happy looking up and wanting to come up and uh, sip little midges on the on the surface. So um, both of them both of them will work. Go well, ahead. I, I'm not going to ask any question right here, but I do want to just say, uh, let's see, it was uh, Martin. Uh, I believe there's a question from Wesley. Uh, there's a question from Alex and a question from Matthew and Michael. We're going to get to those uh, when it makes sense in the presentation. So uh, appreciate the patience there. So back to Scott. Okay. Um, so that's kind of what I was going to talk about with the, as far as rigging goes. If anybody has any other questions or if I didn't cover anything, uh, please feel free to go ahead and ask some questions and I can always jump back to those as well. Um, but now I'm going to talk about uh, fly selection. And some of this I've already covered when I was talking about rigging. Um, but my main tailwater uh, fly is going to be a midge uh, during the winter months. Um, you'll find them on all the tailwaters throughout the state. Um, they work good. And again, go back to kind of what I was saying before. Uh, start playing around with colors, playing around with sizes. Uh, look at what you have uh, going on around you. Uh, some of the tailwaters, like I was saying earlier, you may see some betas. And if you see some betas, go ahead and uh, put like on RS2, Pheasant Tails, Darth Betas. Put on some stuff that those fish are going to recognize and want to go ahead and, and eat. Again, going back to the, uh, the blue, the tailor and the frying pan, the mice those rivers uh, through the spillway that re leads into the river. You get a lot of mice there, and a lot of those fish get nice and big just by gorging themselves on those mice that are getting uh, washed out through the, the dam. Um, some, of the, some of my favorite midge patterns that I like using during the winter months um, the Black Beauty, the Top Secret Midge, Miracle Midges, um, all of those work real good. Um, little Zebra Midges even, uh, if you can get some real tiny ones with a little tungsten on just to help it get down as well, uh, those can work out real well. Um, the Big Midges, ones that I like to use, uh, little uh, uh, Blood Midges, uh, Rojo Midges, all those are are good ones that I like uh, using during the year. Um, again, I was talking about betas, some of the ones that I uh, mentioned, Pheasant Tail, uh, RS2s, um, Darth Betas, Shot Glass Betas. Um, a lot of those different betas patterns uh, will work out too. And if I'm seeing those on the water, then I'm going to put one of those on my rig. Um, if there's still betas present, on any of these tailwaters that you're fishing, uh, those fish recognize them and that's a good food source. And a lot of times they're gonna be a little bit larger than the, the midges. And going with something a little bit larger, a lot of times they can get uh, more calories from eating a bit larger. But um, if those aren't present, then I'm gonna be looking at mainly uh, the midges. Uh, again, with my Attractors and depends upon how you fish it, um, but the leeches, the crane fly larva, uh, eggs, scud, worms, uh, those all work real well. Um, as far as dry flies go, um, my standard dry fly midge pattern that I like using throughout the year is the uh, trusty old Griffith snap. Uh, it works out great um, on water. You can get those real small. Uh, another thing that I like using a lot is a parachute atoms. And I make a little altercation to the parachute atoms and it works out great. They just don't have tails. So usually with the parachute atoms, I'll just snip that tail off and it makes a great little image pattern. And it's a little bit easier to see on the water. Um, that's one of the things that I, I find myself doing quite a bit, especially with some of my uh, smaller... Um, Parachute atoms is just taking that tail off and, and fishing it with the just the just the the fly without the tail, um, and then uh, and then like I covered right up first was the the mices, um, and those are the the main rivers that you find them were the three that I mentioned, um, but they they can work out real good, and those the mice shrimp 
those are patterns that on those three particular tailwaters that you can fix those year round. Um, there's only mites getting washed out of those um, specific rivers, and so uh, it's not just winter fly; it's a year-round fly. And I guess the same can be said with a lot of those midges because all those rivers are going to have midges that hatch all throughout the year, um, so they're always a good bet as well. Uh, during the summer months, when you're getting more uh, insects and you're getting some larger size ones, then again, I like using a little bit uh, larger stuff uh, just because a lot of times those fish, if they're used to seeing those uh, uh, bigger food come by, uh, they're going to, a lot of times, they'll choose a, a more substantial meal rather than taking a, a small midge. But year-round, that's part of their diet, so never hurts throwing those. Um, all right. Now I'm going to go to kind of the, the tactics for fishing them. Uh, a lot of stuff that I've already kind of touched on a little bit, um, but I'm going to go ahead and just cover a little bit more of the, the um, what I'm going to be using and how I'm going to be putting my rig up there. Um, but most of the time when I'm up there during the winter, it's, it's going to be nymph fishing. And again, just managing your depth, getting your indicator set right, um, kind of personal preference, whether it's a thingamabobber or yarn. Like I was saying, yarn is going to give you a, little bit more of a uh, softer presentation when we get it down on the, the water. A lot of times if you're roll casting, it's going to be uh, those thingamabobbers and a little bit harder than the yarn will. Um, if it's windy at all, though, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to a, a thingamabobber because a lot of times in the wind, the yarn will almost act as a little sail trying to cast it, um, and it can make things a little bit tougher. Um, but still, based on preference, if you're using a thingamabobber and you notice that when it comes down on the water, it's spooking fish, then it's definitely something where think about using line, yarn or something a little bit uh, lighter with that. Um, my dry fly rigs... Again, I'm going to be throwing uh, smaller stuff. Um, I'm going to be, instead of a 7.5-foot uh, 4X leader, uh, going with probably a 9-foot uh, 5X and then dropping 6X off it. Um, selective fish, uh, they're going to be picky when they're coming up and eating, uh, so your presentation is going to be very important. Um, with the Going with the uh, a 7.5-foot 4X leader, uh, if I need to get it down deeper than that, if I even if I have a seven and a half foot uh, or a nine foot four x leader, I'm going to add a substantial amount of fluorocarbon onto the end of it. Um, I like using fluorocarbon. I kind of use it year round, but in the winter time, it's uh, very important in my opinion. Those fish are spooky, they're selective, they're smart, and the less light refraction that you have with your tip of material, the better. Uh, fluorocarbon's a little bit more expensive, but it's well worth it. So it's, uh, it's definitely will uh, add value to your day out on the water um, using fluoro over rather than just regular monofilament. Even when I'm throwing dry flies, especially if I'm going with uh, 6X, I'm going to use fluorocarbon at the end of it. Uh, it's going to sink a little bit more, but I'm going to dope up my flies with either a, like a quell or a dry shake. And if I notice it's getting pulled down a little bit more, I'll just reapply. But um, I think it's important to have that stuff on there uh, just because of the, uh, the invisibility or the, uh, how invisible it is to those fish. Um, going with the standard nylon, uh, tip of material, it does float a little bit better in those smaller sizes. If the fish still recognize it, then they're not going to want to eat it a lot of the times. So, um, always, in my opinion, it's always good to go with uh, the fluorocarbon. Um, and even when I'm throwing dry flies, I, I like using it. Um, uh, again, going back to the fluorocarbon that I put on the end of my leader, um, a lot of times, that is going to just help the sink rate of your flies if you have a, a longer piece of uh, thinner diameter tippet at the bottom. Um, it's going to help it get those flies down a little bit quicker. Um, and that's important for uh, getting it to the right depth and 
Uh, if you're using too heavy of line up at the top of it, uh, the thicker the part of the, your leader is, it takes longer for that portion to sink. So if you have a, a longer portion of the fluorocarbon that's real thin down at the bottom, that will help it get down. Um, I touched on this briefly a little bit ago, but Euronymphene is a great way to fish the tailwaters during the winter time. Those low flows, you can sit there and um, get those flies down uh, nice and quick, have your, uh, your, your heavy fly at the bottom and just high stick some of those runs where you're actually seeing some of those fish. Um, it is a very effective way of fishing. Uh, it's one of those ways of fishing that takes a little bit of time to, to get used to it. But once you get used to uh, doing the roll cast, uh, getting that line, uh, slapping it down on the water to get those flies down kind of quick, um, you can really clean up. The people that are very proficient at the Euronymphing really do a good job during the winter months, getting those flies down to the depth they need to, uh, detecting the subtle strikes, and um, it's, a, it's a good way of, of fishing during the winter months. Uh, indicator rigs work just fine, but the, the Euronymphene is a, a great way to go. Um, and then uh, different types of water is going to kind of dictate what type of fishing you're going to be doing, uh, the depth that you're going to be doing, whether you're going to need an uh, indicator rig or a Euronymph rig or a dry fly rig for that matter. Um, so just kind of playing around on the water, seeing what your, uh, see what works best for your situation. Um, and let's see any other questions over there, Yvonne? Yes. A lot, Scott. We have a lot of questions for you. Okay. Uh, one of them is sort of touching on one of these last points for your slide is, uh, Scott. And then also climb Sequoia's ask a similar question. Is there a process of elimination when you are fishing a hole in terms of getting the rig set up correctly? Not sure when I am not catching fish what the issue is. Is it the wrong fly? Am I not deep enough, etc.? cetera? Climb Sequoia's sort of uh, piggybacked off of that and said, how long do you give before switching up? My friends make fun of me for switching it up too quick. See, I'm kind of in uh, your same boat. I like hitting a spot and then if I'm not finding them there, uh, moving on. Uh, one of my first clues for uh, when I approach a, a specific hole and start working it, um, if I see fish in there and my first thing is, am I getting deep enough or am I getting too deep? If I'm not taking bottom at all, then I know that I need to get it down a little bit deeper. If I'm hitting bottom each time through, then I'm going to shorten my rig, make it not quite as deep. Um, if I see fish down in there, you know, fishing and they seem to be active or feeding or every now and then a good clue to see is if you see fish, if you can see the you see them actually feeding in there, then uh, and I know I'm getting down to the right location, right depth, that's when I'm going to go ahead and start playing around with my different flies. If I see that there's fish, I feel like I'm getting the right, then I'm going to go ahead and start adjustments is getting thinner smaller size bugs or different stuff out. Um, one thing I kind of skip over when I was talking about bugs, I was talking about the and meters. Uh, I call them the winter stones, but you'll have some real tiny little stone flies on a lot of the water during the winter. Kind of like a, a size of And those you'll go ahead and try something a little bit different. Uh, maybe they might want some of those uh, instead of uh, what you're throwing at them. Um, if you see specific bugs out on the, the water, then try to match those. And if it's still not working, um, there's times where I just get to the point and where I get frustrated with the hole and touch anything in it. I'll be like, okay, it's time for me to move on. If I'm looking down in a hole and I'm seeing fish, but I'm not really seeing them all that active, I'm not seeing their mouths open and close, uh, try making some drifts at them, get them to eat. Uh, if I get something, I'm going to stick with that color. If I'm missing them, I'm going to go ahead and switch up. Uh, cut my losses, go try to find some fish in another area. Uh, I can always come back to that hole a little bit later. Um, there's days when I get up there and um, 
I feel like sometimes the fish haven't quite woken up yet, where it takes a little bit for them to get active. Uh, there's days where I'll walk right in there and fish are already active and moving around. Other days when it's real cold, it might take those fish a little while to get active and and uh, get feeding. So <clears throat> being kind of patient, working a river or working a specific run, uh, making the adjustments that's needed to get it to where they're at. If you're still not having success, cut your losses, move on to another area. You may may have just fished a hole that uh, somebody else had just walked through and somebody else may have just fished it and that you haven't seen on the river and those fish might be shut down a little bit. So um, I don't mind walking away and uh, cutting my losses, going finding some others uh, in other spots. So uh, next question, Yvonne. Um, Alex Green, this sort of goes back to uh, clothing and, and layering and stuff like that. What gloves do you recommend to... Uh, for keeping warm but retaining dexterity? Um, I like using the uh, fingerless gloves. Uh, tying stuff in the wintertime is tough. Um, and having gloves on and tying stuff is a little bit tougher. Um, but I like having warm hands, so I'm going to have gloves on. A lot of times I'll have a thin liner with a thicker glove over the top. Uh, and it's all kind of based on temperature and what your comfort level is out there. Uh, there's days where I'll put the heater packs under my uh, gloves uh, to keep my hands warm. There's even days where I'll use the nitrile, like the surgical gloves, put those on first, put a heating pad or one of those little hand warmer things underneath it, put a thin layer of fingerless gloves over the top, and then I'll have to put like a Gore-Tex glove over it. Um, it makes it tough to cast. It's hard to feel the line. But at the same time, I want to have warm hands out there. I want to be enjoying my day. And if you get uh, freezing cold fingers, some days it's just not all that enjoyable. So do whatever you can to keep those hands warm. Um, if you start off with a bunch of layers and the day is warming up, then start losing layers. And there's times where I start out my morning with gloves on. Uh, by midday, uh, I put my gloves away and not even thinking about them anymore. Um, one thing with your gloves uh, that's important is anytime you're handling fish, make sure you are taking your gloves off. Um, you'll get your hands wet, but I like carrying a little towel around with me uh, to dry my hands off before I put my hands back in my gloves. Um, dry hands are going to help keep uh, warm hands. So, But at the same time, handling fish with gloves on is uh, it's kind of a no-no. So. Uh, make sure you remove your gloves when you're handling fish. Um, next question, Yvonne. Uh, Matthew's asking, any tips for fishing incredibly low flows, like, for example, the St. Brain, St. Brain near Lyons? Um, so fishing super low flows, um, up there, I mean, again, it's going to be something where you're going to need to use... Um, you're going to need a uh, good casting to get your drift where you want it to go. You're going to need to be able to uh, spot or you don't need to spot the fish, but you need to be able to get it to where you want it to go, where you think that there's fish are. Um, again, when it's super low and there's not much water at all, uh, sometimes you may not even need any split shot at all. Sometimes it might just be one small little beaded fly just to get it down if they're not coming up onto the surface. Um, even sometimes you may just run a, a double fly rig, um, have one of the small ones with just enough weight to it uh, to get it back down. Um, I have two different tins of split shot that I use for when I'm nymphing. Uh, one is the super small split shot and the other is a multiple pack of uh, different sizes where it gets all the way up to the kind of the bigger heavier ones but there's a lot of times where I notice that the split shot that I have in one of my bins is just too big and I need to go to that real tiny little split shot that adds it just enough weight to get it to get just subsurface um, without dragging down through there and catching bottom every drift. So playing around again, situational, playing around with it, get it kind of dialed in, make the adjustments, um, and that will really help. Sometimes you're going to need to get a uh, uh, either an indicator or a dry fly and just do a short dropper right behind the dry fly. Put on something that's going to be tough to sink. Um, uh, use a caddis, use a larger parachute atoms, use a hopper, 
use something that's going to help suspend that so it's only however many uh, inches deep of water that you're fishing. Um, sometimes just putting a, a dry and then a dropper on is a great way to approach water like that, like the St. Brain. So um, let's see. Another question. Uh, Michael Leaves, who is the guy who cleaned for Opt Outside for three straight days. He, nice. he ended up winning uh, the, the G-Series. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Michael uh, at, has two questions. One is, does the lunar cycle impact trout activity? Um, in my opinion, yes, it does. Uh, I find that um, I used to not really pay too much attention to it. But I've noticed over the years of going up and guiding and fishing different rivers, uh, some mornings you get up there and it's on fire. Other mornings it doesn't start really getting active till 10 or even noon. And um, I'm usually a morning guy. I like getting up there early, but uh, sometimes fishing isn't great first thing when you get up there. And sometimes it is. And I think some of it is based on lunar cycles. So I'm not... Uh, I'm not exactly sure how all that works, but I do believe that uh, the lunar cycles play a role in uh, when uh, the peak feeding periods are uh, during the day. Uh, if you've gone out fishing and have been out there before, you'll notice that there's kind of sometimes there's peaks and valleys throughout the day. Uh, some days it's good all day long, and those are always the, the fun days. But other times when it's a little bit tougher, you'll notice that there's some peaks and valleys, and I think that has to do with the, the lunar cycles. So, yes, I do think it plays an issue with the uh, trout feeding. What was the second part of his uh, question? Michael's second question is, is there an absolute low tailwater temp where fish are like, nope, that's it, we're done, don't bother? Um, most of the time, the water that's coming out of the dam is going to be uh, warmer than the, the water that you get further downstream. Um, but if you get to a day where it's just completely iced over and it's just uh, there's only a small section in the center of the river of uh, free ice, those are the days that it might be just a little too cold. Um, my thought on that is if you have to walk out across some ice to get out to open water, it's, that's uh, always kind of a sketchy situation because um, you never know what you're walking over. And if that ice happens to break, uh, that would not, be a, uh, would not be a good thing in uh, the middle of winter fishing at tailwater. So um, most of the time I'm of the opinion that there's going to be fish out there feeding, but um, if it's starting to ice all the way across, yeah, it might be too cold there. Uh, Brady Jones asking, um, if you ever switch up the length of your leader specifically in the winter for these tailwaters? Um, a lot of times I will, depends upon where I'm fishing and, uh, how, what my approach is. Uh, a lot of times with that, uh, seven and a half foot forex leader, I like going with that because then if I tie a longer section of uh, 5X uh, fluorocarbon to it, that's just going to help my sink rate a little bit better. Um, and there's times where I might have to uh, move my indicator down so far if I'm fishing a rig like that or cut my 5X back and uh, tie some 5 or 6X off it. Um, but... Uh, I will make those adjustments during the day. A lot of times I'll just uh, adjust my indicator because if I tie a two, three foot piece of uh, 5X off my uh, 4X leader, uh, sometimes I'll slide my indicator, uh, that yarn all the way almost down at that knot. So that is going to almost act as a hinge point to help those flies sit down. Um, but it's again, it's all kind of situational. So um, it is... Uh, my kind of rule of thumb is I want to get down deep to where the fish are and I'll make my rig deep enough to accomplish that. So, uh, Matthew M has another question. Thoughts on a New Zealand indicator versus other yarn indicators? I like the New Zealand uh, indicator rigs. Um, I think uh, yarn properly doped up uh, works out very well. Um, again, the, one of the things that I like about it most during the winter time is that uh, soft um, landing when you're casting it, where it doesn't come down quite as hard as a 
uh, thingamabobber um, that could spook the fish up there during the, the lower flows. Um, so, uh, but I think uh, yarn, the New Zealand lightning strike stuff, um, I think all that is going to work out good as long as it's properly doped and floating and doing what it's meant to do. Scott, how comfortable do you feel answering technical uh, urinary questions? Um, oof. I, uh, I don't know if I might be technical enough in that. So uh, I could, uh, I'll give you an honest answer whether I can answer it or not. How does that sound? Sounds good. So uh, we okay. have one que well, two questions. One's super old. So let me get back to it. Uh, Martin asked, "How could you talk about your nymphing rigs used in the winter, small flies, slower water, choice of fly on point versus tag? Hey, babe. Um, with those, um, what if your kind of point fly is or your, your anchor fly that's going to get those flies down um, as long as you have something big enough to get it down to the depth that you want it to get down I think is going to be the important part of it um, the tag flies again I'm going to probably go with uh, any of the clues that I see when I approach the river um, but I want something as my kind of my anchor fly or point fly um, something that's going to be getting down enough where you could uh, use a jig headed uh, bead fly if it has enough weight to get it down uh, quick enough then then that's going to work out well it's it all depends upon what's going to get it down to that uh, desired depth to get it through the drift properly this one this one might be uh, too tech it's too technical for me but let's see if you got it got okay in you, Scott. Uh, Derek H asks how you euro how do you euro the low slow waters in the winter dry drop french leader curly q Ooh, that might be a little too technical for me um the low flow waters uh, uh dry droppers do work out good um the euro aspect of it uh with getting those flies down there with that other uh rigging style i'm not quite the uh, uh, versed in Euro nymphing enough to to give an opinion of which way would work out best for that. So fair. I'm still like I'm learning uh, a bit of it as well. I so think, I, uh, I think no expert on Euro nymphing by any means. I think uh, there's a couple guys in the shop that Euro nymph, and then uh, Josh Diller, our guide Euro nymph. So maybe uh, slide into Josh's DMs. Maybe. Yeah. Josh is Josh is very dialed in with it. He's he's very good with uh, at what he does out there. So he would be a good guy to ask. He'll talk. He'll talk right. off about your stuff. That's all I know. <laughs> so this is the last call for questions. Um, I'll give it a couple minutes, and then uh, if nobody has anything else, thank you, Scott. You're welcome. Yeah, I hope I uh, got some information out there for everybody. But um, yeah, thank you for coming and listening. All right. So we have two. These are two. The two last questions. Jason okay. Gutman asks, "How can I make? How can I make sure the sock section of my waders does not wear down while hiking long distances in wading boots?" Um, I think. Uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure about that. I always think that if you have a uh, a good fitting boot and lace it up properly, um, I I put on quite a few miles on my waders all throughout the year, and it's not something that I I think about too much. I like hiking in these wader up before I I head in there. Uh, but yeah, right when you're beginning of the day, make sure those boots are laced up properly, you have uh, any excess uh, neoprene that you have in the stocking foot part, pull that up to the back so it's tight against your toes, and that's that's my best uh, uh, best solution for trying to get the, the waders from wearing down from hiking around in them. Hey, so we have a couple, we have another Euro question, so I think what I'm yeah, seeing from this is that we're going to have to bring on uh, somebody to talk about Euro fishing. So uh, Dallas's question, we'll get to it in a future episode. 
Um, we'll get somebody, uh, an expert in to talk about urine and thing. Uh, last question, and this is from Brooks. I think it's probably the best question. Best winter beer. Best winter beer? Oh, that's a no brainer. But like, so easy, easy. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. What's the best summer beer? Uh, but, uh, oh, that one is uh, Bud Light as well. So same, same for spring. They, uh, oh yeah, same for spring and fall. A uh, great way to stay hydrated. Cup of water in every can. So it's a uh, it's always good to have a Bud Light. So um, yeah, good question there, well, Brooks. Well, that's it. Uh, appreciate it, Scott. You're welcome. So you guys all have a good night. Uh, thank you for joining me on the presentation today.